It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Elizabeth Campbell. Elizabeth is a native of Virginia and a graduate of Virginia Tech, where she received her bachelor's in political science with a concentration in national security. On campus, Elizabeth experienced the bias that many of her professors had and the liberal culture surrounding the campus. Her freshman year, she became involved with Young Americans for Freedom on her campus and became heavily involved in voicing conservative ideas, eventually becoming the chair. During her time in YAF, as well as the chairwoman of the group, she helped bring Ben Shapiro to campus, as well as Kate Obenshane and Noni Darwish. She exposed various instances of bias on her campus as well. Elizabeth was a 2016 Summer Fellow with the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute and now serves as a program officer there. Please help me welcome Elizabeth Campbell. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Grace, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Young America's Foundation, for having me here. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. I was a student attending this conference last year and the year before. So it's a pretty gratifying experience to be able to come back. Um, so before I get into my speech today, I thought it would be fun to wake you all up because I know it's Thursday, 10 AM of NCSC. And I know what you guys have been doing all week. So. <laughs> um, I think many of you have noticed that in the news recently, women's rights from the glass ceiling to the debate over uh, the wage gap and a bunch of other stuff about women's rights have been in the news recently. And I thought it would be fun to compare some prominent women in politics to see if this glass ceiling that they are talking about actually exists. So in this first slide, we have Kellyanne Conway, who served on Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute's board of director for a number of years. She's a successful businesswoman, a wife and a mother. She was the first woman to run a successful presidential campaign. And she's the recipient of CBLPI's Woman of the Year Award, which she was recognized for back in June. She's a strong woman who faces a lot of criticism with poise, and she doesn't use her woman card as a means of qualification. So this next slide is everyone's favorite woman, <laughs> Hillary Clinton. As you can tell, she's very different from Conway, as Clinton is someone who always plays a victim to her identity and uses her gender as her qualification. Next, we have Nikki Haley. <laughs> Not only was she, is she the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., but she was also the first Indian American and woman governor of South Carolina, another woman who didn't play a victim to her identity, but was elected based on her merit. Then we have the exact opposite, <laughs> Elizabeth Warren, who some may know as Pocahontas, <laughs> who lied about being a Native American to advance her career. Here we have my favorite conservative woman. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher. Not only was she the first female prime minister of England, but she was the longest serving prime minister of the 20th century. Many of her policies in England were considered controversial, but she is still known as the greatest pil British politician in, his in their history. So compared to Margaret Thatcher, Nancy Pelosi is someone who has accomplished next to nothing in her leadership positions <laughs> as Speaker of the House and House Minority Leader, at one point telling Congress that they should pass Obamacare so that they could see what was in the bill. And I don't think that that is the order in which legislation is supposed to be created. And finally, we have Claire Booth Luce the namesake of the organization I work for, and the first woman ever appointed to a major ambassadorial post. My favorite story about Claire is how she got her first job. Recently divorced and the mother to a young daughter, she, Claire went to Condé Nast, the owner of Vanity Fair and Vogue, to ask for a job. She was turned down and told to return in three weeks to see if a position had opened up. 
After three weeks, Claire turned up at the office again, only, find, only to find Mr. Nast away to Europe. On her way out, she noticed an empty desk and asked another employee about it. Claire was told that a caption writer had recently left to get married and the position was now open. So, being the determined woman that Claire was, she took off her coat, sat down at the desk, and declared herself ready to work. <laughs> within three weeks, she was on the payroll. And within four years, Claire Booth Luce was the managing editor of Vanity Fair magazine. How incredible is that determination? Women like Claire Booth Luce, Kellyanne Conway, Nikki Haley, and Margaret Thatcher aren't women you're going to hear about in your government or history classes. The left doesn't want you to know about women who didn't play a victim to the, their identity. And as you can see, there's a stark difference between leftist women and conservative women. While leftist women consider themselves victims of their identities, conservative women are advancing in their careers and taking responsibility for themselves. Conservative women are truly the more admirable of the two. As Grace said, my name is Elizabeth Campbell and I'm the program officer of Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute, also known as CBLPI. As the program officer for CBLPI, it is my job to help young women with campus lectures. I help organize our regional summits like the one that we have in Arizona in October. Um, I'm in charge of our spring, summer, and fall fellows, which my summer fellows are out here in the audience. Um, and then later today, we'll be hosting the Women's Luncheon featuring Bay Buchanan. Um, I recently graduated from Virginia Tech back in May, where I was very involved with my YAF group um, and working on campus activism. During my time in the group, I participated in a number of conferences with CBLPI and YAF, um, as well as various activism projects and hosting campus lectures. I was able to bring Ben Shapiro to campus, like Grace said, um, with the help of Young America's Foundation. Uh, and I co-hosted events with YAF and CBLPI to bring Kate Obenshain and Noni Darwish to campus, who are all very admirable and outspoken conservatives. But my conservative story personally is a little different than a lot of people's and a little more drawn out because growing up, my family just didn't talk about politics, they didn't talk about what they believed in, we didn't talk about current events in the news, they just didn't care. Um, and I didn't have an interest in the subject until later on, um, right before I graduated high school. Um, my dad is a small business owner, my mom is actually originally from England, she's an American citizen now. I grew up on my family's rural farm in a town in Virginia, and despite never talking about anything political, I developed many conservative values. Um, I actually wanted to be a veterinary for the longest time, uh, and then I took an advanced biology course when I was in high school, and I realized that I should not pursue that. <laughs> um, but that same year that I took that biology course, I took a course in American history and journalism, and realized that I really had a love for both of the subjects. Um, I also noticed when I was taking my journalism class that I was the only one who was really speaking out with a different view on some, some topics in the news. I was always the one writing the counterpoint to my leftist peer's point. Uh, it wasn't in finish, until I finished my government class my senior year that I actually realized that this was something I wanted to pursue. Um, and I didn't, I didn't know how to, but I knew. I was like, okay, this is something I wanna do. And I knew I leaned towards the right side of the spectrum, but I didn't really know where I fell. Um, at that point, I had been indoctrinated by many teachers. Uh, my peers had shut me down when I was trying to tell them my opinions on different things, and I just didn't think I belonged anywhere. Um, I didn't know what to do. So at the time, I had also been bullied into saying I was a feminist. Um, in my government class, we had a, a discussion one day about tax systems, that was the chapter we had to read, um, and I spoke up when he asked, oh, well, what's your opinions on what kind of taxes we should have? To preface this, I know nothing about economics. I knew nothing then about economics or taxes. I just knew that taxes were taken out of my paycheck. Um, <laughs> and I said, I was like, well, I think a progressive income tax is kind of unfair. Like, why aren't we all just paying the equal part of our paycheck into, into the government? Like, 
that doesn't seem fair to me. And I immediately got shot down. I did not know that that was something I should not have said. I, that was an interesting time in that class. But my, my teacher was really good at facilitating the conversation. He kept coming back to me and asking me why I thought this. And I was just talking about what I read in the chapter. This belief just came from reading. Um, I thought it was common sense to think that a progressive tax wasn't fair. So my classmates kept shutting me down though and I, I kind of got quiet because I didn't know what to do. And then I went to college and I realized that I really was alone in all my classes. Not the kind of alone where my teachers were trying to include me in the conversation, but the kind of alone where my teachers ignored me because they knew I was conservative and they didn't want my input. So by the end of my freshman year, I finally met a girl that was conservative. I mean, it took all semester. Um, and over winter break, I got in touch with her and I asked her, what conservative groups are there on campus? How can I get involved? What can I do? I'm so alone. Um, and that's when she introduced me to former YAF employee, Lauren McHugh, and I got started with Young Americans for Freedom on my campus. Um, and got really involved with the group. And once I got involved, I realized I'm not alone. Um, I finally started to develop my opinions a little better. And I'm so grateful for the time I got to spend in YAF because I learned so much and I had so many amazing opportunities. Um, so my time there was amazing. And as a YAFer, I'm sure you all know that being bold is something that we're always being told to be. Um, so last year when I was interning with CBLPI, the same concept was being drilled in my head that I need to be bold, I need to stand up for what I believe in, and I need to do it in a bold way. So I wanted to use my time today to talk about why it is so bold, so important for conservatives to be bold, and conservative women especially, when it comes to speaking out against the left's claims of being the side of tolerance and the more accepting side, and also being the side that's pro-woman. So although many people think conservative women don't exist, I'm sure you all realize by now that that's not true, we all know they're wrong. Part of my job is to help those conservative college women realize that they aren't alone and to help them spread the reality that the left is actually unabashedly anti-woman. And while it is part of my job to help young women learn how to stand up to the campus bias, it is each of your your jobs to go back to campus and actually stand up to the bias. And I understand how difficult it can be to stand strong in your beliefs and be bold sharing them when you're trying to balance being friends with people or having good grades and trying to maintain those friendships. So this is especially true for conservative women because we are told our ideology is anti-woman and therefore we do not truly identify as conservatives. And the left has no problem name calling and sharing accusatory statements about conservatives. They're pretty bold with their language, calling us bigots, racists, fascists, sexist, Islamophobes, and whatever other terms they can think of that are pretty demoralizing. They will even use the sexist term on conservative women saying that we are traitors to underprivileged women in America. When this happens to me, I usually look at those people and I'm like, well, would you rather live in Nigeria or Saudi Arabia or Pakistan? And that's when they start to get kind of quiet. And the left assumes that all conservatives are privileged, upper middle class, old white guys. Um, and if you don't fit into that specific category, then you're the exception to the rule. So that would mean that all the women here all the women that I've met that are involved with YAF and CBLPI, and all the women that are involved in conservative groups on their campus are an exception to the rule. And the left is wrong to assume this because if you look at your friends in the conservative movement, they don't all fit into one specific category. If you look around this room, you all don't fit into one specific category. Now, like I said, when I was going through high school, no matter who I talked to in politics, always told me that because I'm a woman, I have to be a feminist. I'm sure you all have heard that before. By the time I got to college, I had finally had enough of being told that. Um, 
I studied foreign policy and national security, and a lot of my focus for my research was on the brutal treatment of women in the Middle East and Northern Africa and some other majority Muslim countries. Um, it always baffles me, and it still baffles me that the left claims to be pro-woman, but when they go and have their women's marches or fight for women's rights, it isn't over the hundreds of girls murdered in the so-called name of honor every year or the girls who are forced into marriage with men much, much older than themselves, or the girls who are victims of FGM, fear going to school and educating themselves, and fear what they have to wear because they can end up in jail, being stoned, or murdered. And once I started to connect the dots after researching some of this stuff, I realized how anti-woman the left really was, and I got really upset when people told me that just because I was a woman, I had to be a feminist. I could never identify with the modern feminist movement, and I told them that when they told me I had to be a feminist. I was tired of being quiet at my about my values at that point, so I stopped and I started speaking out. I realized that the left needed to stop categorizing conservatives based on their appearances and their identities. And aren't you all starting to get tired of the left categorizing you based on your gender, race, or assumed privilege? I can vouch for the young woman in this room when I say it is unbelievably irritating when somebody just looks at you and says, oh, you're on the left, or oh, you're a liberal, or oh, you're a feminist because you're a woman. That just isn't so. And it really is quite annoying when the left just assumes your political leaning by looking at you. And maybe the left should take some words out of their own rhetoric and stop assuming people's political identity. <laughs> and this is why being bold is so important. How is the left going to know that so many college students and college women are conservatives if we don't use our voice to say, hey, we're here, we aren't an exception. Look at how many of us there are, and we aren't going anywhere. How are people going to start realizing how anti-woman the left is if we don't start pointing out how they fail to use their platform to empower women, especially those who are truly oppressed, but they just make women feel like they are victims of their identities and can't do anything to fix it? The left makes almost everyone under their platform feel like they are a victim of their identity and there is no way to fix it but the government. And what the left fails to realize is how fortunate Americans, especially American women, are to have so many freedoms within the law. For some context about how fortunate women are in the United States, I wanna share with you some of the laws in Muslim majority countries and under Sharia law. One that is taken to granted by probably everyone here and most people in America is the privilege to obtain a driver's license and drive themselves where they need and want to go. In Saudi Arabia, it is illegal for women to drive or obtain a driver's license and in 2013, two women were arrested um, for doing so. In America, a man and woman's testimony in court is equal under Sharia law a woman's testimony is worth half that of a man's. While women in America can wear what they like in public and feminists fight for the right to free the nipple, if a woman appears in public without a proper hijab in Sharia law countries, she will be imprisoned from 10 days to two months. The one law that really proves how lowly women are considered in these countries is one that feminists in America fight for as their choice. Under Iran's penal code, abortion is always punishable, but the punishment for abortion varies by the gender of the baby. A male aborted baby results in the harshest punishment. A female aborted baby is worth half that of a man's. And if the gender is undeterminable, the punishment is worth three-fourths the punishment of a man. So even unborn, Women in Muslim countries aren't worth something, as, aren't worth the same of something that has the slightest possibility of being a man. Now, what do women in America have to complain about? Women would be murdered in these countries for being openly homosexual, having an abortion, 
refusing to marry as a child, having a child out of wedlock, wearing something deemed inappropriate by the government, but women in America say that they are the ones that are oppressed. Actually, feminists in America say that they are the ones that are oppressed. They claim unequal pay, but women in other countries don't even have the opportunities to educate themselves or get a job. They scream, my body, my choice, while a female baby that is aborted is not even worth the same punishment as an aborted baby who is too young to identify the gender. Even when a woman testifies for rape in a court under Sharia law, they either have to be accompanied by a man or there has to be another woman that is brave enough to join her. And this is what systemic sexism is. It's not what fe feminists claim that systemic sexism is. We don't have laws in America saying that a woman's testimony is worth less than a man's. And it is sad to see that the modern feminist movement refuses to use their platforms to stand up against this. The feminist movement has all of these marches for the right to murder the unborn or get free birth control, but none of their marches are for women who have practically no choice over what they can do with their lives. Two women who are truly upsetting examples of failing to stand up against these laws are Kamala Harris and Linda Sarsour. <laughs> who both have platforms that they can share with the world these awful crimes against women in these countries. Um, the first example I have of this um, just happened earlier this summer. Kamala Harris was sitting in a Senate Homeland Security hearing where two women were who were raised in Muslim families were testifying about their experiences um, and they were giving personal accounts of some of the punishments and treatments I mentioned before. One of the women was a survivor of FGM, but she mentioned during her testimony that she barely survived. Um, and this is something that is prominent in America. DC and the DC metro area actually has the second highest rate of FGM in the country. The other woman testifying had a child out of wedlock, and because of this, she can no longer go out into public without armed guards and has to fear for her life daily. She could very well fall victim to a horrific practice called honor killings where her family is so ashamed of her, they murder her to redeem their family honor. New statistics show that in the US there is at least one honor killing every one to two weeks. While these women poured their hearts out about how awful women in very religious Muslim families in Muslim countries are treated, expecting Ms. Harris to answer questions and contribute to the discussion, Kamala Harris and her colleagues on the left did not create a call to action. In fact, one of Ms. Harris's colleague on the left said that, is, that it was unfair to classify all Muslims in the same category the girls were describing because she thought it was generalizing a religion too much. She said this to two women who were raised in, these, in the Muslim families. The left is so afraid of being accused of being anti-whatever or being called inexclusive that they can't even call out the injustices of a community and stand up for the women that are affected by it. The other public figure, Linda Sarsour, who is one of the organizers of the Women's March, gave a speech recently to a room filled with members of the Muslim community. Instead of using her platform to ask the Muslim community to do something about the horrific practices of honor killings, the unequal treatment of women, um, or the barbaric practice of FGM. She called for the community to stand up to Trump using words as a form of jihad. In fact, Linda Sarsour is known for supporting and promoting Sharia law. So why the feminist, mo feminist movement uses her as one of their main spokespeople, I do not understand. And as conservatives, men and women both, we have got to start pointing out these unjust policies towards women under Sharia law, and we have to hold the left accountable for being so politically correct that they fail to stand up for truly oppressed women. We need to point out that the left is actively supporting the unequal treatment of women when they're supporting people who stand up and want to bring Sharia law to America. And I think we are failing to demonstrate how anti-woman the left is by not using these examples enough. We are so good at giving the left facts and figures, 
talking about why the free market is good and organized economies are bad, why abortion is unethical, or how the wage gap is a myth formed by bad statistics. But when it comes to feminism, feminism we aren't being loud enough about the left's anti-woman values. The left uses emotion in their argument all the time, and I know that sometimes it seems ridiculous to use emotion in an argument, but that's how you win people over to our side. And these stories about these women who are affected by Sharia law are emotional. You need to use them. You need to prove that the left is awful and is so unabashedly anti-woman. In a way that we can accomplish pushing the left is anti-woman, is we need to have more women in our conservative groups, and we need to have more college conservatives, and we need to have you all stand up. We need to talk, have these conservative women talk about why they don't identify with feminism, and pointing out how the feminist movement fails to stand up for women who actually do face discrimination. We need to have these conservative women expose how anti-woman the feminist groups on their campuses are. Conservatives need to take initiative at the beginning of their school year and show new students that there aren't just leftist groups and feminist groups on their campuses. And that those students who may be apolitical don't have to identify with a group that doesn't share their same values. And if we don't start doing that, then when women or students in general enter college with an apathy to politics, the left will win them over to their side by making them believe that the left is the only place that they belong. The left will use their game of identity politics to pull those apathetic students in. And I can't claim to be the perfect activist for conservatism. In fact, I was really hesitant to share my beliefs when I first got involved in the conservative movement. It took a lot of support from my YAF group and from friends to become a bold voice. And I didn't really find that until after I became chair of my Young Americans for Freedom chapter at Virginia Tech. And I honestly thought, like I said earlier, I was the only conservative woman on my campus. I didn't meet a conservative or a conservative woman um, until the end of my first semester of college. And before joining YAF, I had already made the conscious decision that I knew that being a conservative, meaning a person that cares about people, and that the left was only vested in self-interest, but I struggled really voicing that to others. I didn't realize how anti-woman the left on my campus was, however, until I started promoting my first campus lecture with Ben Shapiro. Our group was being really provocative. Um, we called the left crybabies in the event name on Facebook and handed out flyers with um, crybabies and bold on the top of them. Um, but I don't think that's as bad as some of the names that the left calls us. In fact, during the event, I was on the forefront of criticism with multiple people calling me an idiot, racist, privileged, or making fun of my appearance. And I realized that most of the people doing this were women from our campus leftist feminist group. Um, many of the men commenting on the event page were attacking Ben Shapiro, uh, making fun of his height, you know, the like normal things trolls do. And, um, <laughs> But they weren't attacking me personally, what I looked like, my intelligence. Uh, they were attacking him. Um, but the feminists were the ones that were attacking me. They were attacking my group um, and conservatives in general. And obviously, they had nothing to do with their lives because this went on for weeks. Um, and they didn't have an argument if all they could say that, oh, you look stupid or, oh, you're unintelligent. They didn't have an argument. Um, these women who are bashing me and talking poorly of me, some including my professors and my advisors, um, were not pro-women. They were selfish and they were only trying to gain something for themselves. They only wanted to play a victim of their identities. And the feminist mo movement in that moment for me changed for a movement that was like honestly, maybe badly trying to uh, appeal to a large demographic of women to a selfish movement that was only vested in personal gain. And it is saddening to me that we lose so many apathetic students, especially young women, to the leftist agenda because the left somehow convinces them that they're the only side that they fit on. That the left is the side that's for inclusion and for tolerance. 
So if we really want to scare the left, then it is time to start showing people just how wrong they are. We need to push conservative women to voice why they don't need feminism, why the feminist movement fails to promote women who are truly oppressed. We need conservative women to constantly share that they are on the pro-woman side and you, you don't have to be a feminist just because you're a woman. Like I said in the beginning, the left likes to group us into categories based on appearances instead of values. While conservatives certainly have the facts to back up why our systems of government, governing works, we are failing to combat the ways the left is winning people to their side. We need to encourage people to continue pointing out the fallacies in the left's identity politics. And a great way to do this is by having conservative women be strong voices for conservatism on your campuses. If a woman is saying that the left is anti-woman, maybe we'll win over more of those apathetic, apathetic political ladies that enter college and are manipulated by the left. And once conservatives are able to start branding that we are the side that really cares about people, once we start exposing all the policies from the left that inhibits the growth of the individual, that their arguments aren't based in facts and they're just based on identity, guys, and feelings and how selfish they are. I don't think that the left can win when we start pointing these things out. It is vital that we have this momentum on college campuses to avoid four years of indoctrination that many students receive. And you all are the vital piece to exposing the left's hypocrisy. So you need to take what you learned this week back to your campuses and use it to be bolder voices for conservatism. College conservatives can really make a difference. You guys are where the indoctrination, it becomes legit. People who go through four years of indoctrination in college are almost impossible to win back to our side. So go back to your campuses and use what you've learned and you guys are gonna be the left's worst nightmare. Thank you. Shaney Howard from Utah State University. Um, you talked a lot about feminism, however you lack to define it, so would you be willing to give a definition of feminism right now? What definition of feminism do you want? What feminism is. But which definition? Because there's the to modern you. feminist, my, what feminism is to me. Okay, so feminism to me is women just doing what they want to do and having the ability to do what they want to do. In America, you have those opportunities and you have that ability. You can go work um, with a company that will provide you the opportunity to go raise a family, then come back to work. Or you can be a stay-at-home mom. You can go to college. You can, you can really do whatever you want in America. And like I said, the wage gap is a myth um, based on really bad statistics. It's virtually non-existent. So... Um, I don't think that the feminist movement, I don't think that that's their definition, but that's my definition of feminism. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for being here. My name's uh, Jeremy Green. I'm from the University of Maryland at College Park. So a lot of times in debates that I end up having, um, people will say, are you a feminist? And I'll be like, no. And they'll say, oh, so you don't think men and women should have equal rights? And I'll be like, no, that's not what I said. So they're kind of forcing me into that area. So I was just kind of wondering, in that kind of situation, is there a way, because I, I kind of had the same question, is there a way you can kind of redefine it and then say, well, no, this is what feminism is and this is why I'm not a feminist. Okay, yeah, so first, give like my definition of feminism, that women have equal opportunities um, to do what they want to do. Uh, and then talk about how the feminist movement, that's not what they promote. They promote abortion, which is very anti-woman. They promote, um, well, they promote Sharia law. None of them are standing up against Sharia law. That's unbelievably anti-woman. Um, so I would say, yeah, the dictionary definition of feminism, sure, but for what feminism stands for in America right now, I'm not a feminist. So that's how I would approach it. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Michael Bazoin, UCLA. Um, so I would argue that being a female is part of your identity, uh, but you say that you reject the left's identity politics, but by advocating for women's interests, is that not in and of itself identity politics? 
identity politics for the left is like making people feel like they're victims of their identity. So with feminists on the left, uh, they're told, oh, well, you can't, they're, they're told, oh, there's a wage gap, or oh, you're not gonna make it in corporate America, all these ridiculous things. Um, so they feel like they're victims of their identities and there's nothing they can do to change that. I'm saying that conservative women can voice against this and they should get involved in our movement and we should be encouraging them to be involved in our movement because if a conservative woman is saying that the left is anti-woman, we might be able to get some women to kind of listen to us and realize that the left is preaching identity politics where they make people feel like they're victims, not like they can do anything with their lives. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Ms. Good morning. Campbell. My name is Carolyn Lindy. I'm a rising freshman at Hillsdale College. And my question to you is, how do you respond to women, who, Muslim women who believe that the hijab is not oppressive but liberating and often compared to Christian women who dress in a modest sense in America? So um, with the hijab thing, a lot of those Muslim women who are saying that were raised in countries with a lot of freedom, so they think it's their form of standing up for Islam. Um, so they honestly think that they're just doing it for their religion. That's just not so. These, I don't know if you guys saw the story in the news recently where this woman in Saudi Arabia was saw in a skirt and she was like out on the police watch list. They were like looking for her. Um, I'm not sure what ended up happening with that. I'm sure we won't hear what happened with that, but she probably received a harsh punishment. And when I was doing, um, looking up some of these laws in their law, it, states that if a woman doesn't wear hijab, she will be sent to prison. Um, so I don't know why they would say that. I think that they're just very fortunate to live in a country where they're free to wear those things. Um, whereas women in these countries, they fear for their lives if they don't do that. So that's how I would respond. Thank you. Hello, Elizabeth, it's good to see you again. My name is Rosie Lane. I attend Hillsdale College where I'm a rising senior. And one of the main issues on our campus that we've struggled with is apathy, talking about these issues. So as you've mentioned, this conversation is critically important. So especially a young, among young men, and as well as among young women on my campus, there's really this, this apathy about, well, we don't, wanna, we don't really wanna talk about these issues because they're difficult issues. What do you say to those people that share your beliefs, but are, don't have the courage to get up and talk about them? Thanks. Um, I would say, well, you go to Hillsdale, which is a conservative school, so I can understand where the apathy comes from. I went to a very liberal school, and I would point out those liberal schools that don't have anything to counter the feminist groups that women are introduced to as soon as they come in their freshman year. As soon as I walked into my dorm my freshman year, there was a flyer for our campus feminist group. It changed its name, so I don't know what it was called, but... Um, yeah, so that's another thing, guys. Sorry, this is off topic, but feminist groups now don't call themselves feminist groups because they say that's uninclusive to trans women. So um, they're kind of imploding on themselves. Anyways, I would point out how there's places and college students who aren't being exposed to this idea um, that because you're a woman, you don't have to be a feminist, and it's your jobs, and it's our jobs as young women and young men to kind of show why that's true and we need to show the left's anti-woman policies. Um, so you really need to point out those examples where this is happening in other places so that they feel the need to stand up and be voices um, and kind of back those people who are fighting those fights on campus. Thanks, Elizabeth. You're welcome. Hey, Elizabeth. Hey, so, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> This is my yaffer. He goes to tech, so. Hi, everyone. So, uh, first, I'd like to say we're really going to miss you down in Blacksburg. Um, <laughs> and now to my question. I would like to know how you got involved with the Claire Booth Lose Policy Institute. So, I got involved with CBLPI um, through my YAF group. So, Lauren McHugh, I don't know how many of you know her. Uh, she used to work for YAF. She's not here anymore. But she... Um, was an intern at CBLPI a few summers ago, and she told me one year, she was like, okay, apply for this internship. Like, this is a great group for you to get involved in. She kept trying to get me to go to um, their conferences during the semesters. Um, I was kind of reluctant. I was going, doing a lot of things on campus, and it was difficult, but I finally uh, went to something with them, and then I applied to their internship program. Um, I interned with them last summer, and then I applied for the job back in spring, and I don't regret anything. I absolutely love everything that we do at the Institute. Um, the president is Ron Robinson's wife. 
Um, she's, she's an incredible woman. I work with many incredible women. And um, being an all women's conservative group, is, it's kind of interesting and it's also uh, unique because there's so many feminist groups out there, um, as you guys know. And so it's always nice to have like a group of just conservative women who are saying, hey, uh, feminism is awful. So that's kind of what drew me in uh, to the group and it's been great ever since I've been involved. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is uh, Sam uh, from Washington State University. Uh, hi. Um, my question is, what is modern conservatism contingent upon its rejection of identity politics conserved in the last, let's say, 20 years? Uh, can you explain that a little more? So, so modern, modern conservatism, the, the new um, conservatism that a lot of like, very influential media people, especially in like a post, uh, post like newsroom media, so people like Tommy Lahren, um, reject identity politics, and I think of course you as well reject like victimization of identity politics, and I was wondering, um, conservatism comes from of course the word conserve, what has modern conservatism conserved that like you think is, is like really worth holding on to and like what are you proud of conserving? Freedom. I mean. <laughs> so like I said earlier, I think my mom's watching this. My mom is from England and I went there back in May to visit my family and um, even England doesn't have as many freedoms as America guys. Uh, they're one of our closest allies, but they don't have as in many freedoms as we do. And I saw the unfortunate, um, the unfortunate harm that comes from socialized medicine, and um, I saw what it looks like to be in a country that looks like it's stuck in the 60s. Um, we have so many freedoms in America, and I think that the modern conservative move, I just, we're just conservatives to me. Um, I think we're all really pushing for more freedom, and I think we're trying to reverse those policies in the past eight years that have restricted our freedom, um, and that's what I'm most proud of. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, my name is Heather Alfano, and I just wanted to thank you, first of all, for bringing to light a lot of issues um, that are actually, surprise, neither leftist nor right, mm -hmm. um, such as, I had to take notes because there was just so much <laughs> good information. I didn't want to mess anything up. Like, sorry guys, excuse the pause. It is morning after all. Okay, um, for example, um, the fact, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think something you said was that feminists don't fight to end honor killings, child, like the end of child marriage, women not having access to education, and something I'd just like to correct for all of you here um, is that I do go to one of the most feminist colleges in the country, and I also used to completely um, be offended by the word feminist, and when people would tell me, like, oh, because you're pro-life, you're not a feminist, and as someone who goes to one of the most feminist schools in the country, Simmons College, look it up, that is false. And I just wanted to let you know um, also that a lot of the issues that you spoke about um, actually are feminist and some of the things that you did mention. Can you, um, I'm sorry, can you get to your question? You've been talking for a while now and yeah, you haven't asked a question absolutely. yet. I was just wondering why you felt that um, a lot of the issues that are surrounding creating gender equality for women and men, that means, um, for example, like something we talked about yesterday is um, defending men who are raped as well as women, um, why you feel that that's not feminist and why feminism as a whole is bad? Well, we have a woman that's representing the feminist movement that actively supports Sharia law. She actively supports oppressing women in these countries. Um, and I think that that speaks volumes to the feminist movement. That speaks volumes to the feminist movement on my campus who, we had a girl who was taken from Northern Virginia, moved to Pakistan, and um, almost forced to marry at the age of 12. And 
she came and spoke for one of my classes and then my professor stopped her in the middle of her speech and told her that she was defining Islam uh, too broadly and not all Muslims were like that. So I think that they're quieting the people um, and telling them that, oh, this isn't what this religion is like and they're being way too politically correct um, and they aren't taking the stand. They aren't being vocal enough. They're too concerned about um, killing the unborn and getting free birth control and um, just ridiculous things. They aren't being loud enough about the real issues. Thank so that's why I think that they are anti-woman. Thank you. And I'd just like to let you know, though, again, that that's not the entire movement. That is just specific examples, just like how there's a broad range of conservatism. So thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Samir, and I go to Bunker Hill Community College. And I wanted to ask, what do you propose in uh, combating uh, the Islamic world's treatment of women and what can we do to really stop that? Um, well, I think the first thing that we can do is point out when these um, this horrible treatment is happening in America. Like I mentioned before, D.C. and the D.C. metro areas has the second highest rate of FGM in America. Also, if you don't know what FGM is, I'm not going to explain it to you. Look it up on your own time. Um, it's really horrific. It's awful. I mean, it's barbaric. It's absolutely barbaric. And I also said that um, there's new statistics coming out saying that there's an honor killing in the United States. Um, it's like one person every one to two weeks. Um, so that's, that's alarming statistics for the United States. I mean, this is happening here and we aren't talking about it. Nobody is talking about it. Nobody is doing anything about it. So um, I think that that's the first way that we can do it, is talk about how it's happening in our, com in our country in these communities. Um, I, I just think that's the first thing. Then we can work on the problems elsewhere. But what do you propose, like, after talking about it? Doing something about it, actively fighting the crime. I mean, you have to go into these communities. You have to go into okay. the communities and point them out. Hi, ma'am. Thank you for taking your time to come out here today. My name is Jordan. I go to Virginia Military Institute. I was wondering your... I'm from Lexington. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I was wondering your opinion on women in combat and women with regards to the draft. Um, well, I think women should have the freedom to be in combat. I had the pleasure of listening to Amber Smith. I don't know if you all know who she is, but she was a female combat pilot. Um, I have a bunch of friends that are women in the military, um, and I think that they all do great a great job, but I also think that if they're going to be doing the same things that men do, they should probably be held to the same standards that men are being held to. Um, I actually have a lot of friends at VMI who ask me this question too. Um, so yeah, I think that if they're going to be involved in this and they make the decision to be involved in this, then they need to be held to the same standard as men. I know that I've heard stories where women aren't held to the same standards. They have a lower standard set for them. And I'm not saying there are differences in men and women. We are genetically different. Um, but we should be held to the same standards if we're doing something like combat. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.